I actually haven't <clears throat> been in the pulpit much lately. Reason for that, I've been engaged in a, a writing uh, project for the last almost four weeks. Been locked up about seven or eight hours a day writing. It was just one of those things I knew if I didn't give some time to it and make some headway, it'd probably fall by the wayside. But I'm back. So you're going to have to put up with me today. Um, we have a lot of people that have joined us so far this weekend via live stream from across California, Texas, Nevada, Arizona, New York, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, Kansas, Michigan, Tennessee, New Jersey, Hawaii, Kentucky, Massachusetts, Maryland, Missouri, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Virginia, Washington, North Dakota, District of Columbia, Oregon, Alaska, Illinois, New Mexico, New Zealand, Germany, Mexico, Taiwan, Canada, France, Switzerland, Argentina, Australia, the United, Ki United Kingdom, Hong Kong, Japan, Netherlands, Philippines, El Salvador, Brazil, China, the Faroe Islands, South Korea, Ukraine, Sweden, United Arab Emirates, and Indonesia. Good to have you with us. <clears throat> if if you have your Bible, would you please find Matthew chapter 2 and Luke chapter 2. We'll be going back and forth between those two chapters mostly. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Christmas story. As we pick it up in Matthew chapter 2, it's where the wise men come from the east following the star that has announced the birth of the king of the Jews. And <clears throat> when they actually come to Bethlehem, it's quite some time after the birth of Jesus. They don't actually come to the stable and find the babe lying in a manger, which is, means a feeding trough. The scripture says, actually, I think it's verse 11 of chapter 2, that by the time the wise men had made that long journey and inquired of where he might be, that they came into the house where the young child was, and they offered their treasures, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, we don't know exactly how much longer after the birth of Christ it was, but it was sometime after. And we pick it up now in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 2. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Now that's actually a bit of an obscure prophecy that Micah the prophet had spoken more than seven centuries beforehand. And I'd like to just roll back in time a little bit right now and find out just exactly how Joseph and Mary ended up in Bethlehem. If you look with me in Luke chapter 2, and as we pick up the story here, the angel Gabriel has already come to the young virgin Mary and announced, you're highly favored, the Lord is with you, you know, you're blessed among women, and uh, you're going to give birth to the Son of God. And Mary said, well, how? You know, I've never known a man. And the angel said, the power of the highest will overshadow you. And that which is conceived in you by the Spirit will be the Son of God. And she said, well, be it unto me according to your word. The Spirit overshadowed her, and she became pregnant with the Son of God. Now, at that time, she was engaged to a young man named Joseph. And when Joseph heard the story, he wasn't buying it. Just imagine, uh, Joe, I've... Uh, I've got something to tell you. What is it, Mary? What? She said, uh, Joseph, I'm, I'm, I'm pregnant. <clears throat> Mary, what is, it's okay. It's okay. God did it. 
He's got to be thinking, how stupid do you think I am? There's really Joseph, the, 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 an angel and the Holy Spirit, and Joseph just wasn't buying it at all. In fact, the scripture tells us that being a just man, he was trying to work out how he could break off the engagement and put her away secretly so she wouldn't be brought to public humiliation. He didn't believe the story at all until an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, don't be afraid to take to you Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And we pick the story up in verse 1 of Luke chapter 2. And it says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was, while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. So she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, <clears throat> Caesar has this idea to have a census. He wants to find out how many people are living under his dominion. So he says, all right, I want every person in the Roman Empire, I want their, put them to put their name on a list. But he got this idea from somewhere but you know what? I want you to go back to your hometown, wherever that is, and I want you to write your name on the list there. It's crazy. Imagine the whole empire would have been chaotic. People coming and going to and fro, and some people having to go great distances. And Joseph and Mary, they're in Nazareth, but now he's got to go to Bethlehem. That was a 60-mile journey with a pregnant wife. And she's not just a little pregnant. She's pregnant. She gives birth while they're there. 60 miles, days and days of traveling on a donkey or in a wooden cart pulled by a donkey with wooden wheels and no shock absorbers. <clears throat> they would have felt every rut in the road, every bump, every rock. Mary would have been jarred the whole way. You know, the, the trip had to be horrendous for them. How many of you guys remember when your wife was pregnant with your first child? It's like, oh, no, baby, don't lift that. No, honey, I'll get that. You just sit down. You know, you're just protective of that child. By the time it's the second or third child, say, babe, would you mind taking out the trash for me? <laughs> I'm watching the game, you know. But the first one, oh, man, you're so protective. And they've got to camp out on the roadside. Night after night on the way there, having a little campfire. There's, there's bandits in the area. It would have been a very, very difficult trip. Add to that, Joseph is a poor carpenter. They're having to spend what little funds they have to make the trip. And he's got to be thinking, God, why are you letting this happen? They get to the end. It's like somebody tells them, look, there's no room. No, but, but my wife, look at her. She's, she's about to have a baby. Buddy, there's no room. There's no spare rooms at all. Sorry. And so they go find a stable, and she has to have the baby in a stable with animals. And then they lay him in a feeding trough that animals eat out of. Joseph has, Joseph has to be thinking, God, what is going on? I thought that having this child would have your blessing. What am I going to do? We're almost out of money, and I'm almost out of patience. What happened to being highly favored? I, I thought having the child would be a blessed thing. I mean, you said to, to my wife, the, the Lord is with you. Where, well, it doesn't seem like it. Where's the favor you talked about? Where's the blessing you talked about? This just doesn't seem right. And I'll tell you what Joseph was not thinking. He was not thinking, God, I was wondering how you were going to get us to Bethlehem to fulfill that obscure 
700-year-old prophecy. God, this is amazing. No, going forward, he wouldn't have been able to see it at all. It was unknown to him. Looking forward, it only seemed hard and wrong and I'm sure confusing, maybe even cruel. Only by looking backward could they understand what God had done. Think of it, God using a world ruler, Caesar Augustus, and a world system to fulfill his plan. And my friend, the nations are still just a drop in the bucket to him. Like I said, it made no sense. All right, you want to have a census? Find out how many people there are? Great. We'll get everybody's name on the list. No. Something's telling me to make everybody travel back to where they're from to write their name on the list, then they can come home. God was working. He was fulfilling something that he had spoken through the prophet seven centuries before. We come to Matthew, again, chapter 2, this time verse 13. Now when they had departed, that's speaking of the wise men, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. And it was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, out of Egypt I called my son. Now Joseph has to think, this is just getting worse. We don't know anyone in Egypt. We're going to be immigrants in, a, in another country. A mad king is using all of his resources to murder our son. And they've got to sneak away in the middle of the night. God, why? What's going on? It wasn't. Lord, I wondered how you were going to do this and fulfill your plan. This is wonderful. I mean, here you've fulfilled another obscure prophecy. 700 years old. And imagine, God, you using an insane murderous king as a part of your plan. How brilliant. God, that's just so good, fantastic. No, Joseph nor Mary would have been able to see it at all going forward. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 19. Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Joseph was afraid, and that in part led to him ending up in Nazareth. It wasn't God, this is amazing. You planned things out so well. Joseph was not awestruck at God's design and strategy. He didn't see it going forward. He was afraid. Only by looking backwards could he discern the unveiling of God's amazing plan. Going through it, it just looked like trouble, trouble, and more trouble. Do you know, God says this in Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. God declares the end from the beginning. We serve the God who works from back to front. 
God starts at the end of the thing, and then he works his way backwards. Nothing ever takes him by surprise. That's why Romans 8, 28 is true, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. My friend, our mistakes, our failures, world events, God weaves them all throughout his plan. Psalm 76 and 10 declares that even the wrath of man will be made to praise him. Now listen, maybe you've had a really, really hard year. Maybe you've been going through a season that you just haven't understood. It's like, God, where's the favor? Where's the blessing in this? You said you'd never leave me and forsake me, but I haven't seen you anywhere. What's going on? What's happening? Though God does not cause the bad things to happen, they do not take him by surprise. And he is working his plan. Even our blunders are woven into it. And I've got a word for you today. Trust him. Trust him. If not now, going forward, certainly looking back, we'll be able to see his plan even though we don't see it now, he can be trusted. Just keep your heart right. Keep your heart connected to God, even if you don't understand why certain things have happened. You know, we used to, at the old facility, have seven services on the weekend. I preach seven times every weekend, twice on Saturday night, five times on Sunday. And then we actually beamed two of those to, to two other services. So we had nine services, but I preached in seven of them for more than a decade. I preached seven times every weekend plus every Wednesday night. It was physically, emotionally, spiritually draining. And people would line up to be able to get into the services. Many times we had to turn people away. People would park at different remote locations. We had buses that would you know, run every five minutes and drop people off at the church because parking was such an issue. And all we so desperately needed, you know, a, a bigger pot to put the plant in because we were root bound. And uh, we, for years, we, we endeavored to, you know, purchase properties and make things happen and everything fell through. In fact, some of you may even be aware of the, uh, you know, as you go down here, Catella Avenue, hang a left on Los Alamitos Boulevard, the big center down there that has the Target store and there's a Ralph store and a bunch of other things in their restaurants and all that. We actually had a deal for that entire property at one time. We had plans drawn up. The sellers were more than, than happy to sell to us. And at, at some of the meetings, some, a, a few very vocal citizens got up and said, we don't want a church there. Too much traffic. <laughs> and the uh, owners called me in and said, look, Bayless, we love the project. We like you. But this thing's become a lightning rod. And we don't need the negative publicity. We feel it, it, it might endanger some of our other projects. So we're sorry, but we're dropping you. And then when the shopping center, they found out it was going in, the same citizens, true, at the next council meeting said, can we have the church back? Now we're going to have traffic every day. <laughs> it was too late. It was gone. And we had thing after thing after thing happen along those lines. And it was, it was a long period of time. And finally... There, there's some property just right down the boulevard here um, on Catella Avenue. There was, I think it was either six or eight separate parcels, but they were all joined. They were contiguous to one another. But there was four different owners that lived in different parts of the country. And we were told it would be impossible, but, you know, go ahead and try. We worked for a solid year contacting, working with the different owners, and we got all of them to sell. And we joined all of those properties we bought from the four different owners and ended up with an 18-acre site. We're so excited. We worked for a year to make that happen. And then we worked for another solid year in drawing up the plans for the, the campus and the church facilities. And, and we turned them in. So it's been two years. We turned them into the city. Three days after we turned the plans into the city, I got a letter from the city's redevelopment agency saying that they were taking our land from us and that I had to sell it to them immediately for far, far less than it was worth, or they would enact an eminent domain and lock us out of our property and seize it from us, which they did. 
you know, to sell it to a private retailer so that they could get tax dollars. And we went into a legal battle, locked out of our property, went into a legal battle that didn't last for months. It lasted for years and years and years. And it was big news from coast to coast, from the East Coast, major papers, you know, on the East Coast to every paper on the West Coast carried the stories of it. All the, the California papers here carried stories of it. Some of, in fact, of all that time, I only remember one paper here in California that treated us fairly. They weren't biased toward us, but at least they weren't against us. All the rest of them on a regular basis were filled with misinformation about the church, about everything. And in fact, I, I still remember one of the local papers here in Southern California. I arranged to have a lunch with the head of the newspaper, the boss over the whole deal. We went to lunch. I said, why you, you keep writing all this stuff? In fact, they even put a few satirical cartoons in there with my face on them. He says, because it's true. I said, it's not true. I said, Here, here's the truth. And he said, you're lying. That's what he told me. I said, I'm not lying. I said, what I'm saying, all these events, I said, this is how it happened. This is the truth. He said, no, I have it from good sources. That none of that's true. He said, it'll come out in court. I said, well, I hope it does come out in court because what I'm telling you, these are the actual events and this is the truth of the matter. And he basically told me, if what you're saying is true, if it comes out in court, that you're being honest and what you say is right, he said, I will eat my hat. Well, there was five main issues and all the legal thing, and eventually we ended up in federal court. And the church won hands down on all five issues. And the truth came out <clears throat> in court. That man never did eat his hat. He never spoke to me again. He never contacted me. But you know, it was, it was, it was difficult all that time. In fact, it was financially very draining. It was emotionally incredibly draining. All sorts of people in the, the area, because of all the things that were printed, didn't like the church, thought all sorts of things about them. And, you know, through the series of events, you know, I'm not going to get into the whole story, but uh, we ended up now, that was an 18-acre site, now we have 33 acres. And in addition to that, a legal precedent was set that helped the church across America. Because what had happened to us with, you know, a, a city redevelopment agency, it's just some of the folks that are involved in the city, they put on another cap, now they're the redevelopment agency, and they, they would blight a church property. It's like an area, they say, well, we, need, we want more tax dollars, we want some incentives, so hey, that church has been there, let's blight the property, take it away from them for less than it's worth, and we'll sell it to a big box retailer. And that was actually happening across the country. We had churches come out of the woodwork asking for help and with stories where that had happened. Some even in, in cities that surround us. I know one church had been there 100 years and the city came in, blighted the property, took the church that had been there 100 years, took their property away and sold it to a retailer. Completely illegal, complete misuse of what eminent domain's about, but it had been, been rife across the country. And our attorneys told me when we started, they said, look, Bayless, you need to know before we, we start that no church, no institution that's in your position on this side of the equation has ever won a case like this in the history of our country. Statistically, your chances of winning are zero. But we went ahead anyway, and, I, and, and it, like I said, it set a legal precedent that helped the church. And I think it's great that we got a bigger campus and have this great facility, but I think that's the bigger story behind the story. But you know, here's the point. Going through it, man, it was hard. Going through it's like, God, where's the favor you talked about? Going through it's like, where's the blessing in all of this? Another satirical cartoon. I don't exactly feel highly favored today, God. <laughs> but looking back, it's like, God. You're amazing. Yeah. If, if that didn't happen, this couldn't have happened. And if that didn't happen, this couldn't have happened. And if that didn't happen, we wouldn't have met, wouldn't have met this person. And if we didn't met, meet that person, then this wouldn't happen. And then that wouldn't have happened. And we wouldn't end up with double the property and a legal precedent. God, this is amazing. Your, your plans are, are fantastic. Looking back, 
Wow. And, you know, it would have been nice if you could have let us know up front what you were doing. But he very rarely does that. He's the God who declares the beginning and end from opposite sides. He starts at the back and he works forward and he wants us to trust him. Even when life seems to be throwing reasons at you why you shouldn't trust him and seems to throw reasons at you why you should think God is not good, God wants you to trust him. He is God. There is none like him who declares the end from the beginning. And he wants us to trust him. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. And I know some of you, you've been going through the roughest season you've ever been through. Man, keep a right heart. God is working for you. I think about another Joseph in the Bible. Joseph, the son of Jacob. God gave Joseph a dream that his mother and father and his 11 brothers would kneel down and they would serve him and he'd have a position of leadership and authority. He's got this dream from God and it seems so close he could just almost touch it. And then suddenly the bottom falls out. So he's got this dream from God and his brothers get jealous and they throw him in a pit and they sell him to some Midianite traders. And he seems farther away. And those traders take him to Egypt and put him on the auction block in Egypt. And he's sold to a man named Potiphar, goes to work in his house. Potiphar's wife notices that Joseph is handsome. She tries to seduce him, and he won't sleep with her, so she lies and said, hey, that Hebrew boy tells her husband he tried to rape me. Potiphar's furious has Joseph thrown into prison. He interprets the butler's dream and the baker's dream, a couple of Pharaoh's servants that are in prison. Come to pass. The baker's executed, the butler's restored to his position of authority. But Joseph said to the butler, you're going to be restored when you are. Remember me. Get me out of here. And the butler said, oh, yes, but he forgot Joseph. For two years, he sat in that prison. Until finally, Pharaoh has his dream, and the butler says, oh, I remember my sin. There's a guy in prison. He can interpret dreams. Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dream, becomes prime minister over all of Egypt, starts storing grain, and saves much of the known world through all the grain that he'd stored. Now, going through it, it looked hard. It seemed cruel. God, where's the blessing in this? Where's the favor in this? You're with me? Doesn't seem like it. But in actuality, everything that happened, his brothers got jealous, sold him to the Midianite traders. That got Joseph into Egypt. Got sold on the, sold on the auction block to Potiphar. Started working in Potiphar's house. That's where he learned his leadership skills and developed his managing ability and learned the Egyptian language which he would need. Potiphar's wife lies about him, has him thrown in prison. In prison, he was connected with the folks that connected, could connect him to the Pharaoh. He's forgotten for two years, timing. Because at the end of those two years, they could find him. They knew exactly where he'd be. If he would have been released earlier, probably would have gone back to his father's house in Canaan. But here he is. And all of a sudden, the dream that seemed like it was getting farther and farther away, God was actually bringing it closer and closer and closer. And in one stroke, Joseph is the ruler over all the land and actually doesn't just save him, it saves his family and saves much of the known world from starvation. And you know, through it all, through all the times Joseph wouldn't have known what was happening or what God was doing, there's not the slightest tinge of him ever becoming bitter toward God. You don't find the slightest thing anywhere where he's angry, but wherever he is, he serves God and he keeps a right heart. And I want to encourage you, my friend, wherever you are in life, whatever you're doing, as difficult as things have seemed, you keep a right heart, you stay connected with God. He is working his plan.
You know, Jesus and Joseph, there's a lot of similarities there. They both were betrayed and sold for a price. Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was betrayed by Judas and sold for 30 pieces of silver. Joseph was wrongly accused. Jesus was wrongly accused. Joseph was thrown into the prison house. Jesus went into the prison house of death. But through it, they saved the world. Joseph provided physical bread to sustain much of the known world. Jesus gives us the bread of life, eternal life. And you know, God declared the end from the beginning about Christ. In the Garden of Eden, when mankind sinned at the very start, the Lord said this to the devil in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Through the cross, Jesus stepped on Satan's head and destroyed his authority. Mankind that had fallen from a relationship with God and ended up under the authority of a fallen angel, Lucifer, known as Satan, was liberated because of what God did. You know, in the garden, most of us are quite familiar with the story. God creates everything. It's beautiful. It's perfect. It's Adam and Eve. It's yours. Have dominion. Rule over it. Nothing. I don't withhold anything from you. The tree of, tree of life. Any, it's all yours. Except one thing, Adam. Just one thing. You need to stay under my government. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, whether it's an actual tree or symbolic, God was basically saying, listen, I alone am wise enough to set absolute boundaries. I alone can say what's right and wrong, what's sin and what's not sin. But as long as you're willing to live under that, under my authority, we're good. And the devil came into the garden and said to Adam and Eve, well, hey, God knows if you partake of that tree, you can be just like him. You can decide for yourself what's right and wrong. Who says you have to live under God's absolutes? I mean, maybe what's wrong for somebody else, you decide it's not wrong for you. You can make up your own rules. You can say for yourself what's right and what's wrong. There are no absolutes. And Adam said, yeah. And he and Eve partook of that fruit, and they stepped out from under God's authority. God, you're not going to tell us what to do anymore. We'll decide for ourselves if it's right or wrong. Same thing's been wrong with the human race every day since. And the thing was, God said, if you ever make that choice, Adam, the day you do that, you'll die. And the word die there is actually found twice in the Hebrew language. Adam, you'll die, die. You'll die a double death. Now, he didn't die physically right away, but he did die spiritually. The moment he made that choice, he died spiritually. It just means to be cut off from a relationship with God, cut off from the life of God. And the book of Romans says, because of Adam's transgression, because he and Eve were the fountainheads of the human race, that state of spiritual death has been passed on to every human being. And every person intuitively knows something's wrong. Something's missing. There's this crazy missing piece to the puzzle. I can't figure it out, so I'm going to have another drink. I'm going to take another drug. Maybe if I get a new girlfriend, maybe if I, I, I try this or that, get a new boyfriend, get a new husband, get a new wife, maybe that'll fill the empty place. And it never does. Or maybe if I just get more stuff, make more money, climb a little higher on the social ladder, maybe that'll fill it. It never does. Well, maybe I'll just get engaged in extreme sports and adventure, but it doesn't fill the empty place. Well, maybe if I, if I do good works and noble deeds and help the poor, that's good. And you're to be commended, but it doesn't fill the empty place. The only thing that fills that empty place is a relationship with God. The only thing. So we're separated from him. But you know, God who declares the end from the beginning told the devil, says the seed of the woman is going to come and he's going to bruise your head. You're going to bruise his heel. And it happened through the cross. God sent his son, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, and then he was taken wrongfully, accused wrongfully, beaten, tortured, and hung on a cross. And there on the cross, yes, that would be equivalent to having your heel bruised. 
But through his death on the cross, Jesus stepped on the authority that the devil had over the human race, and he broke it. And the Bible says this in 1 John 5 and 19, we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. But the devil, his power was broken, and Jesus arose victorious on the third day, and now the Bible says if you believe that, and if you're willing to confess his lordship, that's not just a magic buzzword, that means boss. That means I'm willing to die to my rights of independent living and come under your authority. You see, the human race stepped out from under God's authority. And death was the result. Jesus paid the price for our sins, and now the way is open for us to step back under his authority. Confess Jesus is Lord. Be reconnected with God and have life. Friend, it's the most serious thing that could happen. It's not just some little box. You know, okay, I went to church. I prayed a little prayer. Good, I'm good. I'm going to go back to my life. It's not that at all. This is a total, complete sellout of who you are to God. That's what making Jesus Lord is about. It's about saying, God, I'm, I'm in. Your absolutes are my absolutes. You say it's right, it's right. You say it's wrong. It's wrong. Regardless of how I feel, regardless of, of what's politically correct, regardless of where the majority stands or which way the majority leans, Jesus is my Lord and his word is my final authority. Serious thing. But we are talking life and death. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's no other way in. And the great news is God gives us the grace to live his way. It's not just about, okay, you know, I hate this, but if it's the only way, I'll sign on the dotted line and I'm going to be miserable with all the joy sucked out of my life till I die. No. God gives us this amazing grace to live his way. And there's fellowship and there's relationship with God. You are meant to walk and talk with him. You'll never find that in a sexual relationship with another man or another woman. You'll never find that in getting a fatter bank account. You'll never find it in a drug. Never find it in a drink. Believe me, I tried that for years and years. It doesn't work. Only by coming to God through Christ. I want to pray with you. I can give you the words to this prayer, but that's sort of the beginning and end of it. But if you mean business, you want to be forgiven, You want to have a relationship with God. If you'll tie your heart around these words and speak them to God sincerely, I believe that God will meet you. If it helps you, just close your eyes right now. The backslider, Jesus is calling. To the one that's been straddling the fence, Jesus is calling. I think it's got to be the most miserable place of all. You know the truth and you're not living it, so... You're not enjoying your relationship with God and you're not enjoying sin. It's a bad place to be. I think that's what Jesus was talking about in the book of Revelation. He said, look, I'd rather have you cold, especially hot, but I'd rather have you cold than lukewarm. You don't want to have one foot on the rowboat and one foot on the dock. You need to be all in. I'm just going to ask you, I'm going to count to three really quickly. If you want to be a part of this prayer, if you're willing to pray, I'm going to ask you to do something, to just lift your hand when I get to three. Just consider that an outward reflection of what's going on in your heart. In your heart, you're reaching up to God. Your hand, sort of a mirror image of that. I'll acknowledge the hands. You can put them down, then we'll all pray together. And honestly, I think a step as easy as lifting a hand can help your faith begin to move to God because faith is always expressed through actions. We believe something, so we do something. And I know that's simple, but I honestly believe it can help you. And then we'll pray. One, it's your moment, friend. Two, are you ready? You want to pray? Backslider, come home. First time, lift your hand up. Three, put it up all over the auditorium. Come on, just keep it up for a minute. Hands in every section. Way to go. I see your hand. More importantly, God sees your heart. Just go ahead and put your hands down. Everybody in the house, put a hand on your heart. Let's talk to God for a minute. Say, oh God. 
I humble myself before you. I know I cannot save myself. I don't look to my good works. I do not look to my personal sacrifices. But I look to you alone. You sent your son, Jesus Christ, to be the sacrifice for my sin. Jesus, upon the cross, you paid my debt in full. And I'm forgiven. I believe you were raised from the dead. And today, Jesus, I make a decision. I am all in. All I am and all I have, I place in your hands, Jesus. And I confess you as the Lord of my life. You lead and I will follow. It is in your name I pray. Amen. Hey. Awesome.